Once you have written the Lewis structure for a compound, then we can use Vesper theory to determine the shape of our molecule. Vesper stands for valence shell electron pair repulsion. And what this is going to do for us is it's going to take into account the unshared electron pairs that affect the shape for the molecule. So the structure is going to be determined by the number of bonded and non-bonded electron pairs around the central atom. The molecular geometry is the true shape of the molecule. And again, it's going to depend on those bonded and non-bonded electron pairs. So we did this table um, in class. And so you should have this in your notes. And basically, you just have to sit down and memorize um, all these shapes so that you can identify what the shape of a molecule is going to be. Um, polarity is where shared electrons are going to spend more time around a, the more electronegative atom. Remember, electronegativity is the attraction for an electron. So what, what's going to happen is you're going to have um, an area of slightly negative charge and an area of slightly positive charge in your molecule. Um, and you can determine polarity by looking at the electronegativity difference as well as looking at the shape. So you can see that the greater the electronegativity difference, the higher we're going to ionic bonds and the less polar our molecule is going to be. Um, if we head towards small electronegativity differences, we're going to have polar covalent bonds right around a difference of 1. And then nonpolar covalent bonds are going to have electronegativity differences close to 0. Now when you're looking at um, the areas of charge, right here is a nonpolar covalent. So all of its charge is equally distributed. So it's all green. Um, as we head towards the ionic side, we get into the polar covalent. You can see that there's areas of positive charge down here, the blue areas, um, and then areas of negative charge up here where the red is. And this is what happens in a water molecule where you've got two non-bonded electron pairs up there, so you have a large area of negative charge. Um, then we head towards our ionic bonds where you have a very large difference in electronegativity, and so the electron is actually transferred. So um, you've got one positive ion and one negative ion. And we'll look at the rest of these pictures um, when we talk about intermolecular forces. So nonpolar substances are going to share electrons equally. They're going to be symmetrical. They're going to have no nonbonded electrons. Polar substances do not share equally. They will have non-bonded, oops, sorry, electron pairs or double bonds. So keep that in mind. So here's the chart again that we did in class. And you'll notice that all of our nonpolar molecules have zero non-bonded electron pairs. The polar molecules do have non-bonded electron pairs. Um, bond energy is something else that we need to consider. The amount of energy required to break bonds is what we call the bond energy. Um, it's also the, the amount of energy that's released when bonds are formed. So if we um, look at hydrogen and chlorine, this is our Lewis structure for HCl. They're sharing that electron. Um, if it breaks apart into the, its, uh, its hydrogen and its chlorine, then it um, it requires 432 kilojoules of energy to break those bonds. Now, if we start out with hydrogen and chlorine and we form HCl, then it releases 432 kilojoules when it forms. So the bond energy is the same regardless of which way you're going. The only difference is the sign. Um, you also need to jot this down into your notes. Make sure you pause this and copy this little diagram. As the number of bonds increases, the bond length is going to decrease, and the bond energy is going to increase. So a single bond has the furthest distance, the longest bond, and it's also the weakest. Double bonds, we've got more electron density in here. We're pulling these molecules together and forms a little bit stronger bond. Triple bond is the strongest and the shortest.